Was it late? Uh, Jesus is Father. The, the, the Father that Jesus knows. Not the Father we grew up thinking He was, but the Father that Jesus knows. There's a way different than the, the, the God the Father that I grew up thinking was, and the Father that Jesus knows is way different. It's a huge difference. Um, first, I want to start with this real quick, because I know some of you are playing. Um, I had put in, uh, there was, there was a, an opening for a chaplain at the, at the jail, the county jail. Yeah. And, um, oh, yeah, you want to hit that in? I forgot. You hit this side, I forgot to hit that side. Thank you. We're going to get you one way or another. All right. Okay. So, um, so welcome to session. Uh, uh, identity to destiny. Now I'm all kind of flustered. Yeah. And tonight's going to be about uh, getting to know the Father. How well do you know Jesus as Father? That's what tonight is. But backing up to, they uh, they had an opening for a chaplain in the uh, in the jail, the county jail. And um, that's my heart. And my heart pounds for that. I've been doing prison ministry. Um, for a, quite a while. I mean, uh, even back when I was a pastor before I did it, it was the one place I knew that it was real ministry. Uh, there was no trying to convince those guys that they needed help. When they come to talk to you, they knew that you had the answers. They knew that that, that was real. It was real, honest, raw uh, uh, relationship with God. It's, it's real. So they had this advertised, or didn't they advertise? Well, they did. They sent a notice on the churches for the chaplain. And so I put in, I got my resume together. I, I'm telling you, the resume looked really good. I had references. They asked for one. I gave them three. Um, I had, uh, oh, actually, I gave them five references. They asked for one letter of recommendation. I gave them three letters of recommendation from pastors, from prison ministry stuff. So everything was like, boom. And everybody I talked to would tell me, you know, you make it to the interview phase, and the job is yours. There's no doubt because... They just need to hear you talk, and there's no doubt that they were coming out of you. Well, so I've been at the interview phase, and it's like, wow. One guy, he told me, he says, you know, the job is not on the board, but a friend told me, the job is yours. It's going to be up to you whether it's who I am. Went through the interview. Boom. It was awesome. I had a great interview talking with them, sharing my story. And then uh, they it took them like three weeks, and they finally – made a decision and I got an email Friday and they decided to go with somebody else. They decided to go with somebody that was already in place working the interim position. And I gotta tell you, it was kind of, it was, it was boom. It was like a shock. And I, I really felt, I know what the disciples felt like when they came and they saw Jesus hanging on that cross. And everything that they, all their hopes, everything that they had, they, just the day before, they're going, just yesterday we had dinner together. And he was telling us this awesome, awesome stuff, and now he's, he's on the cross. You don't come back from that. You know, I mean, that's what I felt, confused, uh, angry, but then not angry, but then upset, but then I was just bewildered. Like, what happened? This was a sideways thing that was not expected but it's kind of an outcome. And it really kind of just knocked me down in, in such a way that, and I got the email at 7 and at 7.30, 7 in the morning, and at 7.30 I had to take, hit the road and go to uh, Durango for the weekend and work all weekend in there. So it was like, boom, I didn't even have a chance to really kind of process stuff, you know? But I, I, I understand what they feel like. Looking up and seeing their hopes hanging on the cross. That's what I felt like. I was looking up and seeing my hopes, my dreams, hanging on the cross. I was reminded of Jesus when uh, the, the tomb and Mary. She went running out to go see Jesus at the tomb. And she gets out to the tomb and the um, tomb is empty. So she went back, she told the disciples that, you know, somebody's taking his body or something because he's gone. And they went running back. And then she comes back and she sees somebody and she thinks it's the gardener, right? She sees Jesus and she thinks it's the gardener. There's, there's a real symbolic thing right there because gardener, if you look up uh, somebody that's a farmer or a gardener, it's, they're a husbandman. So, so in the spirit way of saying it, she did not recognize him as, she, she saw him as the husbandman. And 
she was the bride, right? The bride of Christ, the <coughs> husbandman. And so she didn't recognize him. And then she kind of turned, and then he said her name. And in here, and the I am in here, in here, quickened. And it was like, I know this. And she recognized him. And she went to hold him and grab him. And he said, don't cling to me. Because I have not ascended yet. <clears throat> don't cling to me. And that was the word I got coming back uh, from Durango on Sunday. Don't cling. Because when you cling, if you cling, then you're going to miss what is next. I am. Mm. Don't cling to me. Or you're going to miss what is next. Don't cling to yesterday. Amen. Or you're going to miss tomorrow. Don't cling. And that's what I've been just working through since Sunday is don't cling. And I know I'm not the only one that needs to hear that between these two spaces here and in this room. Don't cling. Whatever you see hanging on that cross, whatever dream, hope, ambition you had hanging on, and you see it, and you're like, what's going on here? I don't understand this. Don't cling because the story's not over. Don't cling. So, that's my word for you tonight, is don't cling. And it really ties into what we talked about when we first started everything, with you got to let go of the boat, you know? Don't cling to the boat. Don't cling to what you think you know and what you think and how you think it's supposed to go. you got to let go of the boat to walk on the water. We, oh, I want to walk on the water. Well, let go of the boat first. You gotta let go of the boat. You gotta let go of everything that you think you know. There is, you can stay in the boat and stay in yesterday. Or you can let go of the boat and walk into tomorrow. So don't claim. There's another t shirt. There's another t shirt. Don't claim. That will be on the backside. So uh, I wanted to, before we jump into uh, tonight's actual study, I wanted to recap on a couple things. The I am not language is the language of need. Remember our, our I am not, right? You're born, and then life happens. And like, you know, I was talking with Trapper, and, and he hit it right on, that uh, these are all wounds. This, those are all wounds. And I when, I when this unfolded for me, I was teaching in Delta Prison, and I had a whiteboard. And it was as I was teaching, this started happening. This message started coming up as I'm teaching, and I'm thinking, somebody needs to write this down, you know? <laughs> right. so, so we have the I am not, and, and the I am not language is the language of need, because the I am not needs control, because it fears. It's always protecting itself from past hurts. Past hurts always cause us to go, ooh, that hurt last time, I don't know. So we need to control it to make sure it doesn't hurt us again. That's what that I am not does. So the I am not language is the language of need. I need that to make myself feel better. I need that car. I need, I need that. You fill in the blank, whatever that need is. Anytime you are, I need that because it's going to fill something here that's missing. That is I am not language. That's exactly what that is. The I am language is the language of love abundant. See, when, when, when it's real love, when it's love, it gives without need. It gives whether anything is returned. It gives. It's an abundant giving without anything in return. Which means I can love and I can give and I can serve even though they're going to spit in my face, they're going to reject me, they're not going to like me, they're not going to appreciate it. They may not even know I'm doing it. But they don't have to know. And I'm not doing it to try and impress God. Because he doesn't care either. He's like, you're not going to impress me. You want to impress me? Be my kid. Let's just have some relationship here. Let's just... Let's just sit and have some face-to-face -face time. That's impressive. You know, to let go. I did a chewable this morning, and I 
nobody's really asked for it. Some people are already on the Truebles, but if you want to be on the Truebles list, it's the WhatsApp. You just got to text me and let me know. This morning's Truebles. Today's true will 10 5, 22. It's called Faithing the Storm. It's not faith if you know the outcome. Faith isn't about your ability to believe in the outcome, no matter the outcome. That's don't claim. That's let go of the boat. I don't know the outcome, but you know, I'm just going to trust. I'm just going to trust. I'm not going to try to figure it out. I'm not going to cling to what was. I'm not going to cling to what I thought it should have been. I'm just going to trust. That's faith. Faith isn't, if your faith was strong enough, brother, you could just, you know, you could move this mountain, you could do all that thing. Faith is just trusting. Even if the mountain doesn't move, it doesn't matter. Because I am in this relationship. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, face to face. So we have Father, Son. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. That that word with is pros, face to face. All things were created by him, for him, through him, and apart from him, apart from him, nothing is created. Everything is inside of this relationship. Everything, 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 everything inside of this relationship. So I just have to trust because I'm not getting out of this relationship. I'm not, I don't have to worry about hanging on to something I think I know like it's out of his ability to fix and make right. I just have to trust. I'll have to let go of what I think needs to happen. <clears throat> uh, okay, I was going to write this down, but I didn't. Only expectations can create disappointment. Only expectations can create disappointment. Disappointment appears where the expectation was supposed to be. I expect that to happen and it doesn't happen, now I'm disappointed because it didn't happen that way. So if we don't have expectations of a certain outcome, we can't be disappointed when it doesn't happen that way. All the expectations can create disappointment. Only expectations can create disappointment. Because the point, disappointment always appears with expectation. The I am not always creates expectations because I am not needs control. I need to create an expectation of how it's going to happen so I know how I'm going to respond to it. And I know I'm going to get involved because whether it's going to hurt me or not. So there's always a need for control. So the I am not always has expectations. And then guess what? There's always disappointment. And guess what? That just feeds the I am not. It just, it's a continuous cycle. Expectation because I need control of it. It doesn't happen that way. I'm really lousy now. I am not any good now. I am not loved, see? Because you had an expectation of something happening a certain way and it didn't go that way. And so now it's I am not again. It just keeps feeding that and feeding that. It's so subtle, it just drags us down. <coughs> it's, it's just amazing how wrapped up in it we are and we don't even know we're wrapped up in it. Um, we just, it's identity. I was in a meeting this morning and the discussion was, and it was about identity, identity. When we go to, uh, remember when Jesus was, he was baptized, Holy Spirit poof, said like a dove, and he took off out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to be tested. And then the, after he'd been there for all that time, you know, he's tired, he's hungry, he's, you know, he's just weak, he's worn out. And then the accuser comes, the tempter comes. What is the tempter attempting with? Identity. If you are the son of God, then satisfy your flesh. If you really are, then you have the power to make these things happen. So make these things happen to show me that you're, you are. And he didn't buy into it. He didn't need to prove who he was because he knew who he was. So when we know who we are, the I am nots don't have control of us anymore and we're not trying to prove something. I am not, but if I just did that, then I can prove that I am. That's I am not language. 
So we got to know who we are. And it happened in the garden. What was the temptation on Eve? Did God really say because, no, if he said that, he knows that you will be like him. So your identity is you're not like him. So if you eat this, then you can't be like him. That was an identity test. She was already made in his image and in his likeness. She already was. So what does the accuser do? Tries to get her off her identity. Tries to steal her identity from her. And ever since then, we have been dealing with the I am not. The identity tree. Just ripped it off. And we've become so ingrained in it, we don't even know it. It's like I said last week. It's like, it's like when you put on glasses. Right? Wearing glasses. Sunglasses, prescription, doesn't matter. I put them on. I don't see the glasses, but I see things differently because of the glasses. That's the I am not. They cause me to see everything else differently. I look at everything differently. And I begin to read things from my I am not glasses. We have it. We don't realize it. We walk in it. We bump into that habit. My I am not beats on your I am not, your I am not beats up like pinball, just bouncing around, just bumping and I am not in each other, not even knowing it. So if we can fix, that's why I keep saying, when we can fix the identity, we fix everything. Here, side note, it's in your notes somewhere. <coughs> Earth's sin is hot. about Hades, right? And I said that ha is a negative or a not. It's a not. And a DS is, is actually I D E I S, I think something like that. And it means to see, observe. So Hades is to not see or observe. Ha Martia, again, we see this, we see this word right here. Ha. See? Ha. So ha is to not. Martia. Uh, it's been translated as saying, well, you're, you're missing the mark. Um, it's, it's, that's, that's pretty good because if you're not seeing the mark, you can't hit the mark. If you don't know what the target is, you can't hit it. So that's, that's pretty good, seeing the mark. But it's not about morals. It's not about making moral mistakes. It's about identity. If you have the wrong identity... You're going to make the wrong choices every single time. When you have the correct identity, you're going to make the correct choices every single time. So we got to find our true identity. Uh, George McDonald says, in his, one of his books, I can't remember which one I've read, quite a few of them. But he says, when a person, actually he says man, when a man knows who he <clears throat> is, he doesn't have to think about what he needs to do, he just does it. It's natural. It's who you are. It's what you do. It comes out of you without you thinking, well, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? Boom, it's a reaction. It's a response. It's, it's who I am. It comes out. That's where we've got to find our true identity. It changes who we are. We can't change who we are by our actions. We think, we think that we can change who I am by how I act. Nope. Because it's out of the overflow of the heart that the actions come forth. It's what's coming out from in here. Remember when we talked about spirit, soul, body. It's what's coming out of the soul which is affecting everything else out here. It's not what comes here. It's what comes out that affects everything. So when we get these two when we get the spirit and the soul working together in union, changes everything. Side note, we will get to this eventually. <laughs> Another side note, on the cross. Anytime you read something in scripture, in scriptures, and you go, why did he put that detail in there? There's a reason why that detail is in there. So what we have to do is not look at the finger, the detail, What's that detail pointing to? What is it trying to say? It's like when I'm trying to teach my dog, go get your phone. 
And he's looking at my finger, you know? No, 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 no. Look where I'm pointing, not what I'm pointing with. So, just to bring this up, um, on the cross, Jesus, boom, dead, on the cross. The Roman centurion came up and pierced his side. And what come out of his side? Water and, and blood. Why that detail? Why water? Why not just say, because when we get to uh, Psalms 22, when it talks about they pierced me, it doesn't say anything about water and blood. So why water and blood? Well, the Holy Spirit represents the water. The water represents the Holy Spirit. The blood represents the soul, the flesh. The two came out together. Jesus was saying, from this point on, there is no separation between your spirit and your soul. They work together. They come out together. They work together. And I grew up, and you may have grown up too the same way, where we've been trying to separate. <clears throat> We're trying to, you know, be spiritual. Don't let your soul have any effect on it. Be spiritual. Trying to separate them again. Jesus died so that they'd be one. He created in himself one new humanity. That's amazing. The creator. John 14, 20. John 14, 20. Mm -hmm. What is it? That you and me and I in you. That's right. John 14, 20. On that day, you're going to realize that I am in my Father. You are in me, humanity. Humanity is in you. And I am in, in you, humanity. Together. Union. It's about union. Okay, I told you we'd get here eventually. <laughs> okay, so, on the paper. <coughs> First page. How well do you know Jesus' as Father? And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about Jesus' as Father. He, he, he knows a different Father than we know. He knows a different Father than we know. When you start looking at the way he talks, you go, he knows a different father than what I was told. He knows a different father. When I began my journey again, second time around, when, when Father God came and got me on that road coming back from in Disappointment Valley, and uh, I said, I can't go back and be a servant in your household. It's just too painful. And he says, I don't want you to be a servant. I have enough of those. I just want you to be my son. Then I knew I had to find out what that meant because I didn't know what that meant. I've been a servant. I didn't know what it meant to be a son. Just be a kid. Just be my kid. Don't do anything. Just be my kid. You know what? Just sit there. Don't do anything. Just be my kid. Let's just sit and hang the couch together. Let's go fishing together. Yeah, okay. From the time we were born, we have been programmed to prejudge. Father God. We grow up with preconceived notions, ideas, and fears about Father God. But do we really know him? Is he the big guy up there, or is he your heavenly father? Is he your judge, or is he your papa? How well do you know Jesus as father? Even the writers of scripture filtered everything they wrote and recorded through their I am not eyes. That's important. When they start translating some words the way they translate them, when you start knowing the real, you go, why would they say it that way? They were filtering through I am not eyes. They were filtering through separate eyes. Our family and societal traditions skew our view of the world, and we don't even know it. It's like our accents. Only we don't hear our accent. Everybody else hears our accent. But we go, what accent? You know? <laughs> I don't got an accent. Uh, yeah, you do. <laughs> we don't hear it. It's like wearing the glasses. Okay, here it is. There are only two beliefs in the world. What are they? My belief and your belief. My belief and the wrong belief. <laughs> yeah. My belief and the wrong belief. How, how does Jesus introduce us to God? How, how did Jesus introduce us to God? Think about, did he say, said the king? Did he say the judge? He said my father. 
My father. He introduced us to God, my father. And he says, your father. You look it up. You want to do a word search through scripture, through the New Testament? Look at all the times he said, your father. Your father. Your father. Not the judge. Not the king. Not the ruler. Your father. So he's your father. He said he's my father. And then he says he's our father. Father. You know, um, oh, I got it right here. There is minimal mention of God as father in the Old Testament, maybe 10 to 15 times. There's around 180 <clears throat> times it's mentioned in the four Gospels. Over 100 times in John alone. I think John was trying to tell us something. You know, when you, read, when you read the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have you, you ever noticed they're a little bit different than John? Yeah. Well, see, John, he spent time on Patmos. He wrote his, his letter, his book, after the Revelation. He wrote the Revelation, came off Patmos, and he wrote the book John. And then he wrote 1, 2, and 3 John. So he had 50, 60 years of getting to know Jesus here. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell us what Jesus did. John, he tells us who Jesus is. When you begin to read through John, you'll see he talks, there's a lot of father relationship. There's a lot of I and the father are one. He starts telling us who Jesus is, not just what he did, who he is. He starts talking about identity. So it's talking about Jesus' identity. Not the things he did, but who his identity is. Doesn't he say, if you know me, to his disciples, if you know me, you know my father? Exactly. Yeah. If you see me, if you know me, how can you tell me who is the father? If you, if you know me, you know my father. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That is so powerful. Yeah. When we start looking at, at all the things we think Jesus did, and we think that they're separated, and what well, Jesus did that, but... I don't know, God, he's kind of different than Jesus. No, he's, he's not. The only reason Jesus did it was because his father was doing it. He only did what he saw his father doing. Right. Good. All right, let's keep reading here. Deuteronomy, here's an example of filtering with I'm not eyes. Deuteronomy 21, 23. Anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. And in Galatians... So this was, uh, Moses was writing that. And then in Galatians, Paul writes, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a, on a pole. Paul took the by God out. He took the cursed by God out. Just cursed. Because Paul was looking back at the situation through Christ's eyes. Paul spent three years, three and a half years on the side of the, in the desert by himself, getting to know Christ in here. That's where he got to know him. So he began to see Christ. He got to know Christ in here. He got to know Christ inside of himself so that he saw everything differently. When we begin to see with Christ's eyes, everything changes. We can see through. We can try and see through. There again, that separation. I'm out here and I'm going to look through Jesus' eyes. Well, then I've got my own opinion about what's going on. Or, if I'm in here and I'm looking with Jesus' eyes, I see it exactly the same way he sees it. I feel what he feels. I hear what he hears. When he talked about his relationship with his father, that's what he was saying. I am looking at life, I am looking at creation with my father's eyes. I listen to it with my father's ears. My heart is my father's heart. So that's why Paul, his view of that hung on a pole was different than cursed by God. He understood that it wasn't God. It was just the curse of hanging on a pole. He separated them two. Okay. Let's keep going. Filter everything. And I do mean everything. You can underline everything. You don't have to, but you can. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Filter everything you think you know about Abba 
Father through the perspective of love. Everything. If you hear a story or somebody tells you something or you read something in Scripture and you go, wait, is that love? Re-examine it. Because God is love. Love isn't something that he does. It's who he is. He can't do anything but love because that's outside of him. That's not him. Because he is love. So anytime you're hearing somebody tell you a story about God and what God's done and how God's doing this, or you read scripture. We just read that scripture in Deuteronomy 21, 23. Anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. Well, that doesn't sound like love. So when Paul quoted, Paul quoted that scripture. If you go back and read it in Galatians 3.13, you read that whole, keep it in context. He quoted that verse, but he didn't say cursed by God. He left off the by God because he goes, that's not love. That's what they saw because they were looking through glasses that caused them to see differently. They didn't see Christ from in here. They were looking from a distance. They were looking from where they thought they were outside. They didn't know that they were right here. They couldn't see in here because they were still wandering around in the darkness. That's why Jesus says, I have come as light so that you shall no longer what? Walk in the darkness. Remain in the darkness. Which means we are. All the way up till Jesus came, then the light came. So when they, all the times that they talked about God, they were given an image of what they thought it looked like in the darkness. Remember what I talked about before? When the light shines on it, it changes. I can, I can tell you about this chair. If it was dark in here, no lights, I'd say this chair is about you know three feet high, uh, four feet high, really tall back. It's got big plush arms on it. It's just huge. And then we turn the lights on, and when the light shines, the light does not shine on what is only imagined. It only shines real. So when the light comes in our imagination, whatever we had imagined, and the light shows up, it's going to look different. Because our imagination saw it one way, and now it's looking different. Now I have a choice. Do I want to cling to the boat and say, no, 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 it can't be that way because that's not how I imagined it. Or do we want to let go of the boat and say, you know what, I'm just going to trust Faith is about trust. Going into a place that you've never been before. Seeing things that you've never seen before. That's trust. That's what faith is. That's what faith is. Okay. Filter everything through this perspective of love. He is love. Without condition. And compare his love to how you feel towards your babies. Whether they be fur babies or little babies or grandbabies or whatever you want on your babies. Think about your love towards them. You just think about your love towards them. And, you know, that was part of the reason why I left the church the first time. Is I really struggled with some of the things that were talked about God. And I'm like, man, that just doesn't sound like love. And while God's ways are higher than our ways. You ever heard that one? <laughs> yeah, that's a cop out saying, well, we don't understand either, but we're going to stick to our tradition and hold on to the boat and just deal with it. You know? Now, how about let's go out and let go of the boat and just see what God shows me about what is truth. I just got to let go of the things that I think I know. You know, my mom asked me one time, um, or she told me one time that she <coughs> feared for my uh, salvation. And I, I told her, my reply to her was, how much do you love me? She says, I love you unconditionally. There's no end to my love. I says, and you're a mere human. Yeah. Just imagine how much more my father loves me. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. You know, and that goes for all of us. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Beyond what we can do. And if we love that much, <laughs> way past our ability to love, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. way past our ability to patiently wait, Mm. patiently waiting 50 years for you to finally get together and say, you know what, yeah, I'm going to do it your way I got. <laughs> All right, Papa, I'm hearing you. I'm getting tired of this life. You know, he'll wait. He's not going anywhere. And he's not worried about losing you, right? 
He's like, there. I'll just wait. We're, you're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'll just wait until you say, hey, okay, I'm tired of that. I'm going to do things differently now. Yeah. yeah. You know what? How did, how did Jesus defeat death? He submitted to it. He had to submit to death. How does Jesus defeat your ego? He submits to it. Because eventually that ego runs into the wall. Eventually that ego trips and falls and gets skin, knees, and hurting and painful and says, okay, that's not worth us over by submitting to us. That's what law does. Love submits without worrying about the outcome. Without worrying about what's coming back. Just submit to love. And just let it go. Okay. Here's another line. This is a good one. It is way more important to know the Father's character than it is to believe in what he can do. Because sometimes what you just knew was supposed to happen doesn't happen. And now you can, in the eye of nuts, dwell on it. And you can just be pulling all that negative right back into you. Or you can say, you know what? I'm not going to cling to it. I'm just going to let go of the boat. I'm just going to let go of the boat. I don't know. Because I know Papa's character to know this ain't over yet. But if I'm always trying to just trust in what he can do, then when he doesn't do it the way he did it last time, I'm confused, and I think he abandoned me, and I think he neglected it, and I start trying to make it happen like he did last time. I'll manipulate it. Come on, I'm not the only one <laughs> that manipulates it because it worked so good last time. It's got to work this time, too. And he's saying, just let go of the boat. Let me do it my way because my way is better than your way. And I did it that way last time because I wanted to get your attention. Now I have your attention. Let's go further. Let's get out of here where there ain't nothing can save you but your, pre your, your relationship and your presence with me. Yes, so it's more important to know the Father's character than it is to believe in what he can do. And I'll say this about his love or about any kind of love. If there's a condition, it's not love. If there's a condition, it's not love. It's barter or bribe or threat. If there is a condition on that love, it's not love. Good stuff. It's fun when you just sit in these chairs and this face-to-face -face and what you just start picking up while you're just sitting there. Without even trying, it just starts, it's awesome. Okay, over on the right-hand side of the page. Family, not kingdom. I've said this before. This is family. It's never been about a kingdom. It's always been about family. Because we think, does anybody remember what rain is? To be the source of everything needed. To be the source, everything that you need, the king or the father is in your life. He's providing everything, food, shelter, comfort. He's the one that kisses your boo-boos and counsels you on how not to do it again so you don't have to need to keep stumbling and falling and making a better life for yourself. That's reigning. And we've confused it with kingdom. And we're thinking he's up there ruling his kingdom. And we want to be a part of that kingdom. And it means reigning. He is the source. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Just change that and say, thy reigning come. And here, thy will be done. When he becomes my source in here, everything I need is right there. Anytime I have a need, where do I go? right there. I go into this spot right here. That's why Jesus said go into that closet, that inner closet, the innermost place in your house. This is your house. Go to that innermost place. You sit there and you commune with me. 
And then everything you need is going to come out of that. It may not be what you want, but everything you need is going to come out of that. So family, not kingdom. No king leaves their throne or they will lose their power and authority. But a father will kneel on the ground to make mud pies with his daughter or play trucks with his son. That's what we've got to start realizing. He is a dad. He's a papa. He's an abba. You know that word abba? That's, that's Arabic. Or, or Aramaic, Aramaic. And it's because like when the little toddlers, the little infants, when they first start talking, you know, they little ones, they start, they go, mom, 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 mom. Well, that's abba, ba, ba, ba. That was, that was papa. That was daddy. Abba, ba, ba. That's what so abba means. It's that little infant toddler learning to talk. That's how intimate it is. And Jesus says, he's your Abba. He's my Abba. He's your Abba. That's how intimate it is. That's not the fun of God that I grew up hearing about. But that's who he is. Okay. So a father will kneel. An Abba will kneel and make mud pies with his daughter or play trucks with his son. What an intimate picture that is. How intimate that is. I'm taking time out of my schedule Let's go play in the dirt. Just to play. You know, I think about my grandson and the time that him and I have spent playing. And I don't make him come up to my level and you need to do better. No. I come to his level so that we can enjoy the time together. We can enjoy the playing, the laughter, the fun. It's not about winning. It's about relationship. Spending time together. Several years ago, I was out there visiting in Utah with him, and I'm playing with him. He's like two, I think, maybe at that time. I'm playing with him. He's laughing. We're having a great time. And I can hear Father God say, you know, he will never remember what you said to him, but he will always remember how you made him feel. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, so it's not about the words. It's about the relationship, the communion, the common Every time you hear the word communion, think of it that way. Common union. That's what communion is about. It's a common union. Take this. This is my, my body, this bread. You eat the bread, what happens? It goes to every part of your body. You can no longer tell what was bread and what is you. They become one. That's what communion is about. Common union. It's a uniting of his body and our body. Okay, excited. <laughs> All right, when we start seeing Jesus as Father with Jesus' eyes, everything we thought we knew about Father God changes. How does Jesus see him? Abba. He's not God. He's Papa. He's not a judge. He's Papa. He's not a king. He's Papa. It's my Papa. Your Papa. Our Papa. Abba. 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 Hmm. Here's a question for you. Was Jesus afraid of his father? No. The no. so why are we? <laughs> right? How many people out there, if you start walking the streets and talking to them, are afraid of Father God? Because they don't know the truth about who. Because we've been fed a lie for a time. And it's saturated. It's not just the churchgoers, it's the people that don't go to church, and there's a reason why they don't go to church. Because they've heard something, or their grandpa heard something, or somebody up their line of ancestry has it down that this is why we do this. We don't go there because they just want your money. Just an excuse. I don't want to go face God. I'm afraid to face God. Because he's just up there with this mean old judge, and he's just judging everything, and he's smiting, and he's cursing, and he's smoking, and he's kicking everybody in the teeth and you know and you and you go well Jesus you know he, he's pretty cool I can hang with Jesus but I don't know about his dad though you know I can't hang with that and I want to go I don't know if I want to be with that God you know do I really want to hang out with that father if he's that mean we've got to change how we talk about father know that he's not mad let him loving how much he loves them by just letting this relationship fill your being 
and it's going to come out everywhere you go. They're going to feel it. They're going to sit there and go, I want some of that. So Jesus was never afraid of his father. How did Jesus see him? Ah, ba, 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 ba. My papa, that's my daddy. We're one. Mark 6. Jesus talks to Papa. He says, Mark 14, 36, Abba, Father. He said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from yet not what I will, but what you will. Ian, Papa. I don't understand this, but I'm not going to cling to it. I'm going to let go of the boat. I don't understand it, but I'm going to let go of the boat. Because I trust you. Even when I don't see what's happening, I'm going to trust you. That's where we have to be in our relationship. We just have to trust. That's faith. Romans 8, 15. We call him Papa. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Papa, Abba, Father. Galatians 4, 6. The Holy Spirit in you calls him Papa. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Papa, Abba, Father. Everybody calls him Papa except for us. Wow. All right. Have you seen the Father? Okay, here's, here's a trouble that I wrote a while back, a couple years ago. It's called the Judge's Seat. Two kids are sitting in a courtroom when a man wearing a black robe enters through the door behind the judge's seat. One of the kids notices him come in. And in a hushed, nervous voice, timidly, timidly says to the other kid, Uh-oh, here comes the judge. The other kid looks up, sees the man, and with a big smile on his face, probably says, Nah, that's my dad. How do you see the father? Are you afraid because he's a judge? Or is he your dad? <sighs> that's powerful. Do you see the judge or do you see your dad? So, what? I just said dad. Oh, dad, there you go. Yeah. See, some of us had fathers that failed. They failed themselves and then they failed their families. They failed their families and they failed themselves because of what was passed down to them about failing. It just keeps getting passed down. We can take it all the way back to Adam. It just keeps rolling down. Because we get stuck in the I am not nation here. Image nation. That's nation. Image nation. Imagination. The I am not nation. Do you guys get that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The I am not nation is the image nation. Yeah. So the I am not nation is all imaginative. It's not real. It's imaginative. But we think it's real. Because we've been feeding into it for so long. We've been told it's real, but it's not real. This is real. This I am not is not real. But we got to learn to listen to this and not this. It has to change. So we get, they got caught up and it got passed down, they got passed down, passed down. Generation, 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 generation. You see it in society. You see it in your, your, your neighborhoods. You see it in the stores you go to. It's just passed down. And so the failing, failing, failing. And... Here, here's a, here's, if they have been taught that this father is a mean judge father, and he's not very nice, and he doesn't like you anyway, but because this son went and did something, he's got to put up with you. You know? I mean, that's kind of how it goes. That's kind of the thought process. That's the psyche that gets into our head that we have to fight against. And it's not just us. We grow through it, but anywhere in the valley. You go around, you start talking. That's the image they have. He's just up there. He's not a very nice guy. His son did something. Yeah, cool. You know, but they don't like him because they don't understand him because he's a mean guy. So, made in his image, right? Made in his image and his likeness. Whatever image you have of Father God is the image you portray. Your image of God is the image that you put out. If he is a loving God, 
everybody. If he is merciful, you're going to be merciful. But we've fed the lie that he is mean and not nice. And that gets into our fathers and our grandfathers and our great-grandfathers. And so how do they act? Mean, judgmental, disappointed in you. And they blame God. Yeah. They blame him for everything that goes wrong in their life. Right. Yep, they blame it. That's that's back into the I am not. Yeah. I am not, and it's God's fault. Yes. And, but whatever image, I want you to really catch that. You can see people, you can tell by the way they talk about God what their image of God is. Mm-hmm. You can tell. If they're over there reading and quote scripture to you about how bad you are, or something else on the corner, or whatever... That's how they see God. That's their God. That's their image of God. Because whatever image you have of Father God is the image you emit. Because that image is what's right here. That's your image of God. Because God is in you, right? Spirit, right? So that becomes your image that you put out. Because it filters through your soul and it comes out that way. Trust me. You guys kind of look like, are you guys following me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can see it. You start watching. You can see it. You hear somebody talk about God, you go, I know what God you think he is. You know, you can tell. If they're putting out love, they know that they've got love. They know they understand God's being merciful and he's not up there just keeping score because he just wants to smoke you. You know, you ever been smoked? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Smote it. Smite, smote, smot. Smote it. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. Um, to some, you guys know where I'm at now? To some, when they see and talk about God, they see and talk about the judge. To others, when they see and talk about God, they see and talk about their dad, their papa, the one they love and trust with their whole being. The one whose lap they look forward to crawling on and whose chest they long to lean against. Listening to his heartbeat, knowing that every beat of his heart is a beat of love for their entire being. That's a papa. You just want to call up his lap and just sit there. Because you know when you're there, you're safe. Everything's going to be okay. You can trust him. You can trust the situation. Okay. Who do you see and talk about when you see and talk about God? That's just a question you don't have to answer, but it's just something to think about. My father. My father. Good. Yeah, this is a good crowd here. You guys all have that intimate so. He's He's someone I can totally trust. Totally trust. Yeah. yeah. I don't have to be afraid of him. Never disappoints. Never disappoint. What did you say, Mark? His glory. His, His glory. glory. Good. Yeah. Glory is character. It's his character. Yeah, it's good. Who did Jesus see and talk about when you saw and talked about him? Father's love. Always about love. So um, in John 5.22, this isn't in there, but you can write this down. John 5.22, Jesus says, The Father judges no one and gives all judgment to the Son. So he's not even judged. He's not even the judge. He gave all judgment to the Son, to Jesus. And now, if you go to John 12, 47 and 48, Jesus says, I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. But the words I have spoken will judge. So even Jesus didn't come to judge, but the words he has spoken He says, by the words I have spoken, they are already judged by those words I have spoken. And the best way to explain this would be my grandson Cooper again. If I said, Cooper, don't go in the kitchen. And then he goes in the kitchen and he burns his little finger. Now, did I punish him for going in the kitchen? No. Were there consequences for his disobedience? Yes. I didn't need to judge him. I didn't need to punish him for that. But he went in there and he burned his little finger. Now he has a choice. Now he can run and hide from Grandpa because he's afraid of Grandpa and what Grandpa might do because he disobeyed, even though he's already got a hurt finger. Or he can run to Grandpa 
and it's, it's bigger, and we kiss his little boobies, and what did we learn? Okay, we're not going to do that no more, right? Because he knows that I love him, and he trusts me. That's the relationship we need to start helping people understand it. This father. Run to him, not from him. I don't care how, how far down the rabbit hole you've gone. Run to him, not from him. Yes. But he still does. Sin has its own consequences. Because we as, our, as human fathers, when our child has done something wrong, we discipline them, but we don't do it, well, not all of us do it because we're just mean. We do it because we love them, and we want them to learn lessons. So I, don't you think God does the same thing? He, um, I think every individual is different. Okay. Some people just know. Like I was talking to some young guy the other day, and he, he had to go buy the furniture place and pay for a thing that he had to pay for because they messed up. And he did it not because, I'm talking about you, <laughs> he did it not because he was afraid of punishment, but he did it because of his love for the Father. So you were disciplined by your own love. He didn't have to discipline. Yeah. You were disciplined by your own love. That love disciplined you. Now, there are others that are still fighting it. They're still fighting it. And so there will be consequences for those actions. There's always consequences. There's always consequences for our actions. Always. And we can blame God. You know, that's why uh, the Apostle Paul and that uh, Deuteronomy, anyone who's talking about a pole is under God's curse. And Paul says, no, that's not God's curse. There was a curse for hanging on the pole, but God didn't do it. It's the law. It was the law, yeah. Basically, right. Well, it had to do with fulfilling the fulfilling. So is the it law. the law that punishes them? Or the law that that judges? The words. Jesus said the very words I have spoken judge them already. Yeah. So there are consequences. The reason he gave those is because there are consequences. If you do this, this is not going to be good. If you go, side note, if you go to um, the garden and what happened in the garden and when he spoke to Eve and when he spoke to Adam, he didn't curse them. He said, because you have done this, now this is going to happen. Because you have done this, now you're going to work hard in the soil and it's going to give you weeds. Because you have done this, you're going to be in pain or in child labor. The only one he cursed is the serpent. The serpent yes. He cursed the serpent because the serpent was the one that was hindering his kids. His curse comes against anything that separates you from him, that tries to keep you away from him. That's what happens. So when you're talking about um, people blaming God for this and that and everything else, is it because the Satan has a hold on them and they're not giving God a chance? They're listening to him just like Eve did in the garden? Blame. That's part of the eye of nuts. That's part of the I'm not. It's not my fault. I'm going to blame somebody else. It started there. Blamed, you know, Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the certain, and they just keep blaming. So we keep blaming them because then we're not facing us. Then we're hiding from Grandpa with our finger instead of running to him and saying, yeah, I messed up. Here, kiss my boobies, make it better. So blaming God for what's going on in our life is an easy cop-out because you, then you don't have to deal with and uh, Richard Rohr, he calls it shadow boxing. Because you have to box the shadows. You gotta box the shadows. You gotta work your way. You gotta you gotta Paul, the apostle, he said, I I buff my flesh. Right? Shadow boxing. You know, you, you work your way through it. Don't have to be perfect, just work your way through it. You just gotta trust, let go, don't don't claim, and work your way through it. But it's easy to blame. As long as I keep blaming, I never have to deal with it. That's the easy way out. Then I can go do it again because it wasn't my fault. If I say it's my fault, I go do it again, I'm just stupid now. <laughs> right? right? Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, this is going to hurt. Oh, this is really going to hurt. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, if you wouldn't keep doing this to me, you know, the devil made me do it. No, put the hammer down. <laughs> Yeah, you just put the hammer down and walk away, and the devil will stop making you do it. Yeah, we, we give the devil way too much credit. And we blame God for way too much. We do. We just need to take responsibility and just do our shadow work. And that's why I'm glad you guys are in this class. Because this is where it really starts happening. 
this has been my, my last four or five years of working through this, and I mean just working through it, walking through it, walking the trail, talking, walking, and talking, and looking at scripture, and searching, and doing it, and it's all came out for this class right here. And so I'm just sharing you things that I have seen along the way, that I've picked up little things. I've done a lot of books, and I've, there's, I've got a good list of books, if you're ever interested, of, of books that I've read that really helped me on the journey. So, just so you know, we're not the only ones on this journey. There are little pockets of people all around the world that are going through this exact same thing. And when the time is right, it's just going to explode. It's just going to really explode. Okay, let's keep going. Thank you. I, didn't, I didn't, wasn't trying to say it not, but I'm saying thank you. That was good. Um, John 14, 7. Oh, okay, another little footnote here. It is impossible to truly love when there is a trust issue. That's why we don't love this father. We don't trust him. Because of all the stories we heard about God gets blamed for something happening, and we hear somebody talk about God did that, well, now what? If, it, if it's on YouTube, it's got to be true, right? <laughs> no, it was right. on Facebook. If it's on Facebook, it's got to be true. So, so we pick up on that, and that affects our filter, and that becomes a part of our language too. And we start saying it, we start believing, we start walking in it, and then we don't trust. And then we pass that down to our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids, and they don't pass down to us. It just keeps getting passed down, and we gotta just start putting a stop to it. We gotta start putting a stop to it and start building this trust. Now, let me tell you this. Love is given. Trust is earned. Love is given, but trust is earned. And this Father, right here, every day that you wake up and get out of bed, He goes to work to earn your trust again. Until we've come to the point that we trust Him and we just let go of the boat. And we don't know what it's like out here, but we just trust him. It doesn't, I don't, we come to the point where I don't have to know anymore. I just trust him. And every day, he is working to earn our trust. And how does he do it? We go through a little difficulty. And he carries us through the other side. And we go, huh, okay. And then we do it again. And we do it again. Um, I got another. When we know him, we recognize his voice. That's right. Um, it blows my mind. People will trust Facebook and this and that. And yeah. Else, but yet they won't give Father a chance. Yeah. They put him down. And okay, here's another chill from September 8th. The joy of the journey comes in the looking back at it. The joy of the journey comes in the looking back at it. It's the journey and you're going through how I know what was going on here. That's the trust. Every time we get past it and we come to the side and we look back at it, we go, I see what he's doing. He was, he did have me. He was carrying me through that. He was taking care of the situation. I didn't see it. Now trust is built. That's how Jesus was able to pray for the ones who are crucifying him. And you brought that up, and it's in there, going to get there. Who actually prayed that? Jesus. I only say what I hear my father saying. Well, God. Yeah. So Father God, God was saying, yeah. forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Right. So he, Father was telling Jesus, yeah. forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Well, that's why I'm saying what you just said about looking in the back, looking yeah. back to find the joy. I picture Jesus hanging from that cross and enduring it all because he is looking back and seeing what he's accomplished, you know? You know, and, and, and continuing on with that jewel is, yeah, therefore the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Well, that was the joy that was set before him. He wasn't looking back at it, except in this spot right here, this is an eternal spot that has no time or distance. So when he is in this spot, he's looking forward, but at the exact same time, because of where he's at, 
He's looking back at it. That's why he has the joy of what he's gone through, even though he hasn't gone through it yet. Because he can see it from his father's perspective. Therefore, the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Because he was looking back at it. But the joy of the journey is in the looking back at it. Here, continue on. But you can't live there in that looking back. You have to turn back around and be present in your now journey. Then you will have something to look back at later. Those are troubles. Okay. We're doing good. We're doing good. Second Corinthians. Uh, oh, no, no, no. We're uh, on the uh, left-hand side, right? John 14, 7, 9 through 10. If you really know me, right? Margie said this. Good. Were you looking ahead? <laughs> if you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus answered, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is me is in me? The words I say to you do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. It is the Father living in me who is doing his work right here. The Father in him doing his work. John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. I think John's really trying to he picked up on something that Jesus was saying that the others just didn't pick up on. And because he spent all the time getting to know Jesus in here. All right, whatever Jesus did was actually the Father doing it through Jesus. When Jesus healed the sick, that was the Father. When Jesus fed the thousands, that was the Father. When Jesus forgave the woman caught in adultery even though she didn't ask for it, that was who? Father. Father. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet, that was Father. the Father. When Jesus told the disciples the greatest of all was the servant of all, and then demonstrated that by serving all, that was the Father. Here we go. Reign, the servant of all, is reigning, providing everything you need. The servant of all humanity, of all creation. Reigning. It's a kingdom that is about being the source of everything you need. Is this good? <laughs> this is good. Yeah, really good. Uh, okay. When Jesus laid down his life for all of creation, that was the Father. When Jesus asked the Father to forgive those that crucified him, who do you think that was? That was the Father. See, we don't know the Father like Jesus knows the Father. Oh, to know the Father the way Jesus knows the Father. Powerful. There is no fear of letting go of the cloak. There's, that's why Jesus told the disciples when they took off, he sent them off in twos, remember that? Go, 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 minister. But don't take anything, don't take an extra coat, don't take money for your pocket, don't take anything, just go. And they went, and everything they needed was taken care of. Whoa, can we get to that point of just trust? Okay, whatever Jesus was doing, that was the Father. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So here we go, back to our chairs, right? Father God, the Son, Christ. Father God, was in Christ reconciling the world, the cosmos, to himself. That was Father God reconciling the world. That's key. At some point, it's going to really start clicking. That's Father God reconciling the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? And then we think that that's, well, I'm going to give my son... And then he's going to go and he's going to reconcile things. Father God reconciled the world in Christ. He did that. He didn't reconcile himself to the world. He reconciled the world to himself. He got the world to turn back around to face him without fear. Because we've been afraid and we've been running from it. 
You got to chew on that one for a while. That's going to hit you in the middle of the night sometime and go, whoa, wait a minute. This was always about what the Father was doing. And uh, you mean I didn't really have anything to do with it? Jesus said, no, I did it. You were with me when it happened. Well, don't be upset with us when we call you at 3 in the morning. Hey, I'm up. <laughs> I'm already up. I said, like, come on true. over and let the dog out. <laughs> That's right. Okay. That was the Father reconciling the world to himself. That was the Father not counting sin. What is our message? Go back up there to 2 Corinthians 5.19. Very last couple lines there. What is our message? And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Our message is, you are reconciled. You are reconciled. That's our message. You are reconciled. It has committed to us the message of reconciliation because we did it in Christ 2,000 years ago. You are reconciled. Stop running. You are reconciled. Like I said last week, when I drew that terrible picture of this outline of a hammer, it looked like a hatchet, but if we know that that's there, we know something's missing, that's lost, well, you can't be lost if you don't already have a place. You don't just show up and go make room for me. There's already a place. So that was Father not counting sin. 2,000 years ago. John, 1 John 4, 16. God is love. It's not what he does. It's who he is. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth and always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So if God is love and love is all those things, then Father God is all those things. <coughs> Father God is patient and kind. He does not envy or boast. He is not proud, nor does he dishonor others with accusations. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. And he keeps no record of wrongs. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> keeps no record. See, but we do the wrong. We do the disobedient thing, like my grandson, and we run and hide. And then we keep a record of it. Where is it written? Right here, this I am not tree, this right nation of I am not. We keep a record of it, and we think everybody else is keeping a record of it because we did it. And so we're afraid to run over here and get the healing and get the health that comes from the mistake made. We need to stop. Which is the road less traveled? Perfection or peace? Peace. peace. And why is the road that leads to destruction? See, we, we think we've got to be perfect. And so what happens? No peace. But when it's okay not to be perfect, when it's okay because this father is not judging you by it, he's not condemning you by it. Yes, you got a burnt finger for your disobedience because you did it to yourself through your disobedience. Because you weren't listening to right here, you were feeding on this instead of listening to this, and you made choices that took you to that. Isn't a revelation? No, it doesn't need God does judge, and he has a book that he opens up wrongs were done. Uh, so he's kept the record there. there but that's record. for the people who did repent, I think, right? Well, the, that record, when you, when you look at the word judge, it is to divide, is what it means, to, to separate what is and what isn't. So in that book of Revelation, when he opens up that book, I don't think we fully understand what that means. I really don't think we fully understand. Because otherwise, all that produces is fear of what that's going to produce. And that's not love. So we need to go and research that further to find out what was implied by that. Because remember, they were still filtering through I am not glasses too. And so we need to go figure out what that means revolving love. And then no matter what you, no matter where you are, no matter what you decide with that book and that judgment, what happens with those and the goats and the sheep and, the, and all that, it all is in here. It's all inside of this relationship. So you just have to wrestle with it 
you find out where you land on that with all of that stuff, where you fit all that inside of here, because apart from him, there is nothing. So all of that happens in here, which means in here is this. It's in here because it's a created thing. So all of that is in this relationship right here. Maybe he doesn't keep a record of wrongs for the ones who belong to him, you know, because we have to accept him as our father, you know. I, but, but once all our sins are forgiven, as soon as we ask for them, so yeah. that, there wouldn't be a judgment because we are already forgiven. Well, and like, he, like Jesus said, Jesus said, the father judges no one. And then Jesus said, because he'd given all judgment to the Son. And then Jesus says, I didn't come in the world to judge it. I came to save it. The words I have spoken already judge them. So I think maybe in that book are the words that he has spoken and those that have decided or listened to it or whatever. I don't know. That's, that's kind of a grasty thing. What I do know is he is love. He is merciful. And... Let me find this scripture for you. Let me find something else. Um, let me find this verse for you right here. You can write these verses down and look them up. Mm -hmm. um, and it is uh, 2 Samuel 14 14 and Micah 7 18. And then I will read them to you out of the NIV. 2 Samuel 14, 14. And Micah 7, 18. 2 Samuel 14, 14 says, Like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be recovered, so we must die. But that is not what God desires. Rather, he devises ways that a banished person does not remain banished from him. Mm -hmm. Micah 7, 18. NIV. Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. Now, he is eternal. So his anger doesn't burn forever. So there is more going on in the unseen heavenly realm than we realize. And so that's why I say, put everything inside of this relationship. And then you just have to wrestle with it. And you're going to be just, and that's what God wants anyway. Papa wants you to wrestle with him. Like Jacob. Remember Jacob, the story of Jacob? He had to wrestle with him. And then what happened? Touched his hip. So, took his strength. That's your strongest muscle. He touched him. So that he couldn't have no more strength. No longer relying on his own self. And he grabbed onto him and said, I'm not letting go of you until you bless me. Until you make this worth my while. And he said, your name will no longer be Jacob, trickster, heel catcher. Your name will now be Israel, one that wrestles with God. One that has been, when we get to week six, one that has been rubbed by God, and you come out the other side of it because what you were is gone. Here are you new. You have to wrestle with God to get to that new. Okay. Okay. Now I got um we're gonna we're gonna wrap it with this. Here's a poem um, that I want to share with you guys. Uh, take and pass back. Take and pass back. Don't fall, Terry. Why? <laughs> Stretch before you move too. Yeah. 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 Hold on to it. Go ahead and take one and pass them back. Thank you, Fred. And we're going to read it together. That way you can read it with me. Well, I'll read it and you can follow along. Thank you. Is there we go in? Yeah, it's the paper because it's a good poem. This is a poem by uh, David Tinson. It's called... Uh, have we got one? All right. By David Tinson, it's called And You Wait. Okay, here it is. I wanted to do my own thing, and you let me. After all. You gave me this will, this floundering will, that gives me a sense of me, a sense of control, a sense of choice, and you wait. You wait like a father who gives his girl a new bike, and she goes missing for hours. 
You wait like a father who gives his son his inheritance, knowing he'll make a mess of things. And you wait. You wait on the street till dusk, sure that she'll come home before the darkness sets in. You wait at the gate and run when you see his soul staggering into the city. And you welcome. You welcome the strong of will, the rebellious heart, the limit tester, the boundary pusher, the bankrupt and broken. You welcome any will that comes home, even for a short time. You welcome me. Your door is always open, as are your arms. The feast forever prepared. Tears of joy ready to cross the threshold of your cheeks. Father and Spirit, creator of wills. Your immutable will to love and forgive compels creation to do the same. And I will that allows us to disobey. And then he just waits to earn our trust. Power. Power. Let's pray. Papa, thank you. Thank you for this time that we share here together. Thank you, Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for being here with us, for guiding and directing us. Give us eyes to see, to see with your eyes, to see your Father with your eyes. Give us a heart to understand the way you understand your Father. Give us ears to what you hear from your Father. We thank you, we praise you, we honor you, we love you. Holy name, Lord Jesus. Through Christ. Amen. 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 Good class. Thank you. Don't be so. I know.